for six days in the pilgrimage, in the sweltering heat of a desert in Mecca, okay? Six days walking to the Mount Arafah, okay? Maybe miles and miles in the desert. After all of this, making the pilgrimage, the Hajj, he came, he said, Umar, I carried my mother on the back throughout the whole of the pilgrimage. Did I pay her back now? And Umar said, you didn't pay her back for one tear she shed when she gave birth to you. That's respecting women. That's respecting women. Huh? You see, we Muslims, we respect the woman for the thing that God has created her for. Huh? And that's not to say it's not sexist. You know, men have been created for a role and women have been created for a role. Now you can give me all your wishy-washy ideals that you like. But at the end of the day, if you send the women out to work and you get the men staying at home, you'll see what happens to your society. You see it in America right now. They're sending the women out to work. Who looks after the kids? You know who looks after the kids? The street gangs. The street gangs. There's no love in the house. There's morality. No one's teaching them morals anymore. No one's teaching them right or wrong because they don't even know what's right or wrong. They're confused. The woman doesn't know what being a woman is and the man doesn't know what being a man is. No one knows anything anymore. And they're confused. So the kids, they don't know what to do. They want love. They want affection. They want mummy. Where's my mummy? Huh? But there's no money. So what does he do? He's out on the street. So he finds his substitute mother, the gang. And they say, listen, kid, you want to join our gang? You know what you have to do? You have to break this thing, smash this thing, shoot this person. 11 year old kids shooting people so they can join a gang. And they're proud. Hey, I shot him. Mate. Yeah, huh? Huh? And you're saying now it's urban warfare. I was reading a brother sent me an extract from the Washington Post. Huh? The guy saying, what are we even talking about sending troops to Bosnia? Send troops to Washington DC. It's open warfare here. Huh? Why? Because your family is destroyed. Your society is corrupted because you haven't, you're not following the natural path anymore. You're confused about your identity. The woman isn't a woman anymore. The man isn't a man anymore. And you find that all your wishy-washy ideals, what's it doing? Destruction. You see, because Islam deals with the reality, because Islam is revealed by the one who knows the reality, Allah, the creator. Huh? You see, so when you implement Islam, you find it works. And this is one of the proofs that Islam is from God. You find that the laws of Islam, you call them harsh, you call them medieval, but they produce a peaceful, successful, prosperous society when they're implemented, which we don't find today. Most countries, they don't implement Islam. And even if they do, they just implement it like Saddam Hussein. He just wants to chop people's hands off and impose his authority. So he just, you know, imposes these so-called things out of context. Huh? But the reality is when Islam is implemented, it works. It's practical. You see, we talked about death and paradise and the afterlife and hellfire, that's all real. And I don't want you to forget that for a minute. But I'm telling you about right here, right now. Huh? How are we going to make this world a better place? You may think the last place you'll ever think of looking is to the Quran. You think that's the last, it's the last place I ever thought of looking. Huh? But you tell me, huh? what's going to be the cure for this society, the consumer society? Huh? Is life and happiness in life by having lots of money and surrounding yourself uh, with possessions and things? Is that really where happiness lies? And why do, do we find that 17% of the world's population are consuming 70% of its resources? 17% uh? consuming 70% of the world's resources. Uh? You know why? It's because of a lie. It's because of a lie, a lie that you have to consume to be happy. You have to smoke this, drink that, listen to this, watch this movie, huh? dress like this, look like Naomi Campbell, then you'll be happy. But it's a lie, people. That's not where happiness lies. That's not where happiness lies. You're not going to find happiness there. Happiness is a state of the heart. I even talked to a guy yesterday. I said, what's going to make you drinking beer? I said, why are you drinking that? He said, I want to get a bit of happiness in my life. So I said, so you're not happy. He said, yeah, that's true. I'm not happy. I said, what's going to make you happy? He said, when I go back to Africa. I said, no. Huh? You're not going to be happy when you go that. Happiness is right here. Right here. And that little piece of flesh called your heart. If it's whole, your whole body is whole. If it's corrupted, your whole body is corrupted. That little piece of flesh, your heart. That's where happiness is. Huh? And if you have it, the happiness and the peace and tranquility in your heart, Nothing's gonna get you down people, but where are you gonna find it? Where are you gonna find it? Where are you gonna get it? 
You can't buy it in the supermarket. You can't buy it off the shelf. You earn happiness. You earn it because it's something that God, your Lord, your Creator, He sends it down into your heart. Peace and tranquility. So you can only earn happiness by pleasing Him. Huh? And you see, that's the reality because Islam is a practical religion that deals with practical realities of how should people live their life. I'll give you another example. Now you're besetted in the West with crime. Well, is it surprising? What do you do with your criminals? What do you do with them? You catch a criminal and you send him to prison. He sits down with a load of other guys, a load of other criminals, and they teach each other how to be better thieves. So when he comes out in society, he now he's perfected in the eye. If he didn't know he was ignorant before, you sure bet after he's been in prison, he's not ignorant anymore. So you pay your governments to like send these people to like universities. Huh? Universities. You might as well get a PhD in master criminality. Huh? You send them there and you say, oh, well, this is the compassionate way. This is our Western way. You see, we're liberal and we're compassionate. But are you compassionate? Are you compassionate to the person who's been shot, the shopkeeper who got stabbed, the man who's got his house breaking into, he spent all his life earning things and it was all taken away? Is that compassionate? Huh? He got his money stolen. Is that compassionate? And are you being compassionate to the thief? thief? Are you being, you know, being compassionate to the thief will mean you'll stop him stealing. But you don't stop the thief stealing. You encourage him to steal more. Huh? And on top of that, the whole, the whole way your society thinks, the whole way of thinking is, listen, money, money, money. Have a car, have a TV, have the latest this, have the latest that. So people, of course, they're going to go and steal. Of course they're going to go and steal. They think happiness means surrounding yourself with lots of riches. So if they can't get it by earning it because they can't get employed, they'll go and steal it. They don't know anything else. Huh? They don't know it now in America. Now in America, you see, you call us Muslims. You see, we're defeatists. We're defeatists. Huh? We believe in God's decree. Huh? We religious people teach the poor to be patient and therefore they don't strive. What are you doing in America now? Now in America, you've decided, you're deciding now that you're going to administer drugs to black people because they have a problem in their minds and it makes them violent. Huh? First, you teach them that you have to have lots of money and lots of nice things in life to make you happy. And when they can't get them, what do you do? Give them drugs to keep them quiet. Huh? There's something wrong there. There's something wrong there. And there's a hell of a lot wrong there, people. Okay? But in Islam, you see, let me tell you Islam now. First of all, in Islam, the Quran tells you that this life is a test. This life is a test. And this world and everything in it, in fact, the Prophet Muhammad said, that he put it with a group of his companions, they passed a dead goat, a dead goat lying, rotting. Imagine the flies and the heat and the maggots. Huh? And he said, who will buy this goat for one dirham? One dirham. Huh? They said, prophet of God, none of us would buy it for a dirham. And even if it was alive, we wouldn't buy it because it's got slits in its ears and it's deformed. So he said, he said, by Allah, by Allah, the whole world is more worthless in the sight of God than this dead goat is in your eyes. Huh? The whole world is more worthless in the sight of God than this dead goat is in your eyes. And the Quran tells you, you know what the similitude of the life of the world, the example of the life of the world, it's like the rain. It comes down from the sky, the earth absorbs it, the vegetation absorbs it, the crops grow, the sun comes down, huh? and what do you find? Everyone delights. Look at that beautiful crop. I'm going to get the wheat now. I'm going to get my fruit now. He's delighted. Huh? But the sun comes and the sun dries it and the wind blows and scatters it. Open. That's the life. It's just coming and going, people. Huh? But we, we worship it. We worship this thing, this nothing, this dust. Huh? Oh, I said it. So people, this is the reality. Huh? But now we're told that no, this life is it. This life is the most important. But Islam says no, people, the life is a test to see whether you'll use this life. Well, if you've got money, will you use the money to give charity, to be kind to your relatives? Huh? Or will your heart be attached to it? Will your heart love it? It's a test. And if you're poor, what will you do? Run after money your whole life? Run, run, run? Huh? Or will you be content? 
And when you be patient and continue being grateful to God and continue worshipping God, that's the purpose of the life. But the life is short. It's 30 years, 40 years and it's gone, finished and you're in your graves. So the Quran and Islam doesn't teach you to run after the world. It teaches you, hey, this world is nothing. Your peace and tranquility is in worshipping your Lord, in striving to be righteous, to be good, to be charitable, to be kind to your parents, to be good to your neighbor, to help the poor, to help the needy, to heal the sick, to help the traveler when they're on their way, huh? and to fight and struggle and strive with your life and your money and your property to call people to that truth, that reality that will bring the real peace and tranquility in their hearts. So now imagine the Islamic society, Islamic society of people uh, who are not dedicated to loving the world, to chasing after money, to chasing after the things of the world. No, are people who realize that they should be chasing after good deeds, after righteousness. Uh, and then in this context, Islam says, if someone steals, not because they're hungry, not because they need what they're stealing, but they steal out of greed, then their hand should be chopped off. It should be removed. Oh, very brutal and barbaric, you say. But listen, what have you got? What have you got? Your prison system. Remember the university for thieves? Do you help the thief? Do you help the, the innocent people? You don't. But you know, I'll tell you something. I've been to Saudi Arabia two or three times. I've seen it with my eyes. I've seen it with my eyes. And I'm not saying Saudi Arabia is a true Islamic state, but it has the laws, some of the laws of Islam. And without a doubt, Islam is very important there. And you find even on the TV, they have religious programs, a lot of religious programs, religious channels, religious radio stations. And Islam is important. Most of the people, they go to the mosque, they pray five times a day. Huh? And there's a lot of Western influence there, but still, you know, this is a country that has its roots and still some of the laws of Islam. Now, this I witnessed this with my eyes and 40 years ago, 40 years ago, people would say that you could go to Mecca and Medina and when the call to prayer comes and the streets are deserted, deserted, everyone goes to pray, a man would take a cloth and cover his shop. He would just take a cloth and cover it. And this was even the gold, the gold. Can you imagine a whole, imagine from down there to here, all gold, gold shops. And when, and when the prayer, and he just takes a cloth and covers it. Can you imagine that in this country? Huh? But you see, we're talking about a way of life, the works that manifest itself practically. Yes, it's tough. Yes, it's hard. But is life just a game? Is life just a play? No, it's not people. You see, and the reality is, okay, that we are responsible. You have to realize that you're not innocent. You're not innocent. You walk around here, go to the pub, go to the cinema. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm living in England. It's a nice democratic society. Huh? It's all okay. You've done nothing. But every time a child, every time a child is kidnapped, every time a woman is raped, every time a thief goes back into society and steals, you are going to be held account for it. Because you are following a false way of life. You are following a false ideology. And you are supporting, even tacitly, even by remaining silent, even by failing to worship Allah and follow the way He revealed to you. You see, me, I hope I'll be relieved of responsibility, at least because I come here and try and tell you people, fear Allah, worship Allah. Here's the solution. Here's the way. I don't accept this state of affairs. There's a better way. I hope that I have an excuse. But what's your excuse? Huh? Oh, religion, Islam, terrorists, huh? women wearing veils. Huh? What a lot of rubbish, primitive, barbaric. Who told you all of this? Who told you? Really, did you do your own research? Did you read the Quran? Did you read the saying of the Prophet Muhammad? Did you read the history of Islamic civilization when we had lighting in the streets of Cordoba? Lighting and baths in every street corner and libraries in every street corner? Like you have pubs, we had mosques and baths and libraries. Huh? And when you wanted to go and study, when you thought that having a bath more than once a year was an unwise thing to do and Queen Elizabeth was considered a bit strange because she used to bath once a year uh, you came to our lands, the lands of the Muslims to learn 
to study because that was the center of life. You know what's so interesting? The Muslims have left Islam. The Muslims have left their religion. You go to Iraq, you go to Syria, you go to anywhere. You'll see, okay, you'll see them going to the mosque. That's some of them. But the reality is you find in their hearts, in their lives, they've lost their religion. They've lost their religion. And the thing is you find that when the Muslims turned away from their religion, their society and their civilization declined. But when the West turned away from Christianity, when it turned, when the West turned away from its religion, that's when the West became successful. You see, in the West, you think you equate religion with medieval, barbaric, old-fashioned. But we in the Muslim world, we equate religion with civilization, with enlightenment, with science. Because that's our past. Your past is the medieval past. Your past is when you got to found a witch, used to duck her in the thing and throw her in the pond. And if she floated up, then she was a witch. Of course she's going to float up. The poor woman's going to drown if she doesn't float up. Huh? So it's a no-win situation, right? The witch sinks to the bottom and drowns. Okay, that's okay. She wasn't a witch. It doesn't matter. Huh? You see, when your women, when you went on the crusades, what did you put? Chastity belts on them, right? So with a poor woman, she's going to the loo and stuff. You finally came back, okay? He couldn't sleep with her anymore because she was all infected. There was nothing to sleep with anymore. Huh? Chastity belts. Huh? Your medieval ages, okay? Well, look at your medieval ages. Your feudalism. What? I covered this already. I talked about this 15 no, minutes ago, so I apologize. No, no, I'm listen. I can't go over everything again and again for every person who comes every five minutes. Can I answer? No, no, I, I covered it already. You, the next gentleman, he comes up after 10 minutes. Okay, no, no, no. Maybe someone listening today, maybe someone who listened to what I said could explain. Maybe even a non-Muslim could explain to her what I said about the veil. Huh? What I said about it. Huh? You see people, because Islam is a practical way of life. It works. It works. You see now when your newspapers talk, oh, this Muslims are throw back to the Middle Ages. Yeah, for us, what you call your dark ages was the age of enlightenment, was the age of civilization. Huh? It wasn't dark ages for the Muslims, but when you were ruled by Christianity, you were living in your dark ages. Why? You know why? Because Christianity is a lie. And when you left the lie, when you left the lie, you changed. You advanced. Huh? But when we Muslims, we have the truth, and the truth made us noble, and the truth made us strong, but we left the truth. And so what happened? Allah humiliated us. He humiliated us. Huh? Study. Read for yourself. Go and find out for yourself and see for yourself, people. Because Islam is not just a religion of the next life, it's a religion for this life, for the here and for the now. And I know you don't like it, right? But those Muslim fundamentalists, those mad men of God, you call them, huh? the mad men of God, what do they say it in French? How do they call it? I can't remember how it goes. The, the mad men of God, they call them in Algeria. Huh? The fanatics, the fundamentalists. You see people, when the companion of the Prophet Muhammad, when he went and he was invited by the Persian general Rostrum, and because the Muslims were fighting the Persians, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, the Muslims started fighting the Persians. And this Persian general, he called him and he said, why are you fighting us? If you want camels, we'll give you camels and go back to the desert. You want women and money, we'll give you it, just go back. He said, no, we've come to call the people <coughs> away from the worship of men to the worship of the one true God, Allah. We've come to call them away from the injustices of man-made religions to the justice of Islam. We've come to take them out of the darkness into the light. That's why the Muslims, they fought. That's why those Muslim soldiers in 20 years, in 20 years, they conquered the largest peace, the largest empire the world has seen, apart from the Mongol empire, from Morocco to China in a mere 20 to 40 years. In 40 years. And all for what? For money? For booty? No. To bring the people the light and the justice of Islam. That's the only reason. Which I have tried to explain to you and illustrate to you practically how Islam will improve your life. How Islam will improve the life 
of your family. It will give you the right direction and it will tell you the reason for which you've been created and teach you how to manifest that purpose practically in your life. People, so the message of the prophets was not only to tell you that there's a hellfire and there surely is. And it wasn't only to tell you that there's a day of judgment and there surely is. And it wasn't only to tell you that there's a paradise and there surely is. But it was also to teach us how to live right here, right now. So people, we say with absolute knowledge and we can prove, we believe we can prove it to you that Islam will bring you the good success of this life and the next life. The true success of this life and the next life. So I pray to Allah and I hope that Allah will accept my efforts to call you to that success of this life and the next. And may Allah guide you and me towards it. And I say God's peace and blessings be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>
you know? And everything that's evil, not everything, but a lot of the things that are evil, people are saying it's good. And everything, the traditional values, you know, they're getting turned upside down on their head. But a lot of these traditional values, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And the reason they're traditional is because it's, it's the natural, natural way of human beings. We had a lady here saying, oh, we go backward, we go backward, okay? Well, what's wrong with going backward? Is the future necessarily better than the past? Is it necessarily that the future is better than the past? I don't think so. Huh? I don't agree. That doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to be true that what's the latest thing is necessarily the best thing. You know, it's not an argument. Okay? So, uh, I, I don't support that use of the terminology merchandise. Okay? And I have to say that the Muslim woman is far from being a type of possession or something like that. But what he's trying to say is the Muslim woman is something very precious. Something very, very precious. And I think most women will admit they love their men to be protective <coughs> over them. They love to feel that their men, you know, think that they're something special. Okay? And Islam really, really treats the woman like that. A true Muslim man. As the Prophet said, the Prophet Muhammad said, the best of you, the Muslim men, the best Muslim men are the ones who are best to their wives. Huh? The, the best of you are the ones who are best to their wives. Huh? So that's how the Prophet described. The best men are the ones who are best to their wives. Alhamdulillah. So we, there's no doubt that Islam respects women, that there's love, encouraged love, okay, and this type of affection. And alhamdulillah, also at the same time, it's practically dealing with the condition of the human being. Is there any more questions, please? Please don't feel shy about any queries or something, anything you like, because I can't give a speech now, I'm just too tired. Please, there must be some questions. No questions about Islam? Are women allowed to follow the same sticking on the women here. Uh, are women, well, uh, the lady here, what's your name, buddy? You don't mind me asking your name, do you? Uh, Gabrielle. Gabrielle here pointed out that the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad, Khadija, she had her own business. So there's nothing wrong with a woman having her own business. It's allowed in Islam. It's allowed in Islam for a woman to have her own business. But also, that has to be, you see, you have to understand that's within the context of the other obligations the woman has. For example, she should cover herself, she should avoid as much as is possible mixing with men, you know, and men also they have to avoid mixing with women, you understand? So within the context of that, there's no problem for a woman to have her own business and we have the example of the first wife and for, the, for so many years the only wife of Prophet Muhammad, Khadija. So, and there's other examples of Muslim women and things they used to do. So there's no harm in her yani, having a business or a profession, but within the confines of the other rules and regulations in Islam. And Allah knows best. Any more questions, please? About anything else, any topic you like. Salman Rushdie, can ask about him. Are you not embarrassed to try and answer? Huh? Any questions? Ladies over there in the bay, you got some questions about Islam? Huh? What's the, what's the biggest difference between Islam and Christianity? The, he's asking, what's the biggest difference between Islam and Christianity? Well, the biggest difference is that I have to say this straight out. The Christians really are pagans, okay? They worship three gods. They believe a man is God. And the real difference between us is the difference of what we believe about God. We believe God is a being who is glorious and he is holy above manifesting himself in the form of any creature, okay? That God is above that. He is perfect. And that to say that God is a man, or that God has children, is to say the worst thing and to do the worst thing that a human being can do. Of course, otherwise we share lots of things in common. Huh? We share lots of things in common, the Muslims and the Christians. But the big difference is this issue of the nature of God and the nature of revelation. We don't believe that God reveals himself personally through the Holy Spirit to every single human being, okay? We believe that God has revealed himself through chosen prophets, Muhammad being the final, and he has left that revelation in the form of a book, the Quran, and the prophetic teachings, the Sunnah.